Today we're going to take a look at section 5.1. We're going to be looking at addition and subtraction of integers. Um, the manipulatives that I've handed out you're going to need in this lesson, and we're going to need it in section 5.2 as well when we talk about multiplication and division. So um, what you have in your hand are called chips, right? And so they're dual-sided, two colors on each side. And what they're going to do for us is to represent integers, okay? So what integers are um, is integers are the number system that it's the positive whole numbers and their additive inverses. So I'm gonna put dot, 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 and I'm gonna have negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, three, and on. So sometimes people will describe this as the positive and negative whole numbers. Uh, maybe a better description really is that it's the whole numbers and their additive inverses. Um, additive inverses means, and we'll get to the definition specifically later, but it means the number we would have to add to a number to get back to zero. So negative three is the additive inverse of three because it's the number I would have to add to three to get back to zero. Okay, so our first model is called the chip model. And the, um, can I have some of the chips actually? Okay. So you'll notice that the chips that you have, um, and these are the ones that we got a few years back, are double-sided. That's very friendly. Um, and so one side represents a positive number, and then one side represents a negative number. Uh, and there's really nothing super special about the colors of them. If we were being perfectly honest, I would much rather the yellow side be black. I would rather them be black and then be red. Um, that's a little bit more conventional. I have a feeling that it had to do with being colorful more than being um, sort of intuitive when these little objects were created. So we like to let red be negatives um, in general because you've heard the phrase in the red and in the black before possibly, or maybe you've worked with spreadsheets um, or sheets inside of Google um, and anytime a number is negative, it turns it red. And if it's positive, it stays black, okay? So um, red in the financial world represents debt, okay? So when you hear people talk about being in the black, which is our yellow side, it means that they're not in debt, right? It's a positive value. One fun fact as well, you guys have all heard of Black Friday, without a doubt. Do you know what it's really referencing? It's really referencing that that day in the calendar year was the first day in the world of business that most businesses started turning a profit. What does that mean? Well, it means up to that point, they'd been working at a negative throughout the year on their sales. So if you start counting at the beginning of the year, everything they purchase and then they sell to people and they purchase and they sell to people, it's not until Black Friday that they're actually making money. That's kind of crazy. That's where the name came from, it's Black Friday. So what we're going to be doing with these chips is representing our positive and our negative numbers. And on my screen, I will use yellow and I'll use red just like you have to represent this. And you can just flip yours back and forth and that's really nice. Um, in terms of future classroom environment for you, you don't have to have the plastic chips, right? You can use construction paper for this. Do they have to be circles? Well, of course they don't have to be circles. So cut things in squares because it's easier to cut them, right? You know, that kind of stuff. Um, you can also, if you wanted to do something, use um, poker chips. You can either use poker chips that are already different colors because those are really pretty cheap to buy, or you can take the poker chips and you can put a sticker on one side to make them a different color. That's how we used to play this game called sequence in my world. Um, and so sequence chips were like that. They had a sticker on one side and then they were the actual poker chip color on the other. So when we're working with these, we're taking a look at numbers like five plus negative three. And so your mm, like writing surface area is usually drawn as a circle. And then what you're going to do is you're going to put five positive chips. So on your paper, like, like let's let your paper represent my circle. I want you to put five positive chips down. Lily's already got her five there. Okay, so five positive chips. And I'm gonna do the same. Okay, so you should have five dots. Do you? Wonderful. And then you're going to have three negative chips. This is what your like working area, your surface mat should look like, right? And then what we do is we pair things up into something called a zero pair. 
So for those of you who have taken proportional statistical reasoning, which is a couple of you, um, we saw this happen in that course as well. Um, and for those of you who will be taking that with me next fall or over the summer, you're going to see that as the same thing. So we're pairing these up because a zero pair cancels each other out. So we pair these up. And as we pair them up, we should only have one color kind, one type of chip left, one color of chip left. In this case, there are two that are yellow. And then this would be the number two. Okay. So the biggest reason for the why on this would be to exactly tell you that I still have ninth graders in my house who struggle with adding and subtracting positive and negative numbers. It is a struggle. They want to change signs or not change signs. They want to add when they're supposed to subtract because they do not have a firm idea of what in the world they're doing. They really just don't. Um, and that's unfortunate. Um, and to try and go back and to work with them frustrates them too, right? Because they feel like this that you're looking at is sort of silly. Like that's what they did back in elementary school, not these children, my, my children specifically, but this is what elementary kids do. You know, this is, what they, this is what they would have done in middle school. And they're not middle school anymore, so they don't want to deal with it, right? But if they had a better idea of what they were really doing, then this might actually work out better for them. This is what it looks like with a chip model. All good? Okay. Slide your chips away, stack them up. We're not going to need them for a few more problems. I'm going to work with you. The next one is called a charged fields model. Charged fields model does a really nice job of giving the same pictorial representation that we just did, but we're doing it with charges. Okay? So when we see this model, our five is represented by five positives. And our three is represented by three negatives. So all we've done is we've changed yellow and red chips into pluses and minuses. All right, and this is because you're seeing these two images back to back, of course, that you see the image. Um, but the idea, of course, should sort of resonate, right? I had five as a positive number, so I've written five pluses. I had three negatives, so I've written three negatives, right? Three is a negative number. Um, and so the other thing that it does is it justifies for us why zero pairs cancel each other out. If you have something that's positive, counteracted with something with negative, those are opposite of one another, right? Think electrical charges, things like that. These are opposite things. And so again, these are zero pairs and they cancel one another out. And so while the image itself yields something quite similar to what we did before, the perspective of the why is, is a little different and perhaps might resonate with a child in a very, you know, in a little bit different way. Okay, so these are two models. Model number three, model number three is probably my favorite. It probably is. It's the one that I go to when I try to explain this to my children still at this point. They're a little bit less reluctant to deal with a number line model than they are with chips, okay? So a number line model, what we're doing is, draw my number line, is we're starting on a number line at zero. This can be really good for your kinesthetic learners because you could put a number line on the ground, couldn't you? Okay, so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to let my desks be my number line and we will start, pull this one over here. We will start with this one right here being zero, like where I'm starting, okay? So this is, this is my starting place. This is my starting place. So if I'm going to do five, I'm gonna move five in one direction, right? And the, the direction that we use by convention is the right-hand side. So on the screen, I'm gonna go over to here. Here's five. And in my desk, I'm gonna go one, two, three, four, and I'm gonna go five, and I'm stopping right here in front of Chesney, right? This is five. And what do you think my negative three is gonna tell me to do? It's gonna tell me to go backwards three. So in some sense, I've gone this direction over here to five, and I'm supposed to go backwards three, so here's one, and then two, and then three. And if this were marked on the ground, like think masking tape, not very expensive sort of convention, right? Then we'd be able to very easily see that I landed over here if I went backwards three at two. And so I have the number two. I feel like this works really well because if I subtracted say minus seven, right? If it said minus seven at the end, right? Then doing this, I would just keep moving further enough that I would be over here and justifiably I would be at negative two, right? So I can see it in terms of a number line as well. I don't need the negative two for this particular problem, but I could do it if I had a bigger negative number than I had a positive number. 
All right. Patterns is my least favorite one. Um, and I really love patterns. So I'll tell you, I think about math as patterns. Okay, that, that is how I think about math. Um, however, um, I don't particularly love this model. <laughs> just really transparent with you. I just don't love this model. But there are students who do. Okay? So this is a patterns model. So what we're going to do is we're going to establish a pattern based on what we know about addition by starting with something we know how to add. And I'm arbitrarily deciding I'm going to take my 5 at the beginning. I'm going to add 2 to it. So if I do 5 plus 2, what do I have? 7. But I want this 2 to get closer and eventually get to negative 3. So now I'm going to add something a little bit smaller. 5 plus 1 is 6. And I'll do 5 plus 0, and that is 5. Good job, Ethan. They're all over the floor now. <laughs> all right. So what, are, what we're trying to do is have enough of them we can establish a pattern, right? The pattern here in the middle is that I've gone from 2 to 1 to 0. And the result over here is that I went from 7 to 6 to 5. They go down one at a time. And so I'm going to continue my pattern by moving to adding a negative 1. And the pattern over here will continue without me thinking I know what 5 plus negative 1 is. Instead, I'm thinking about my pattern on the right-hand side. My pattern went 7, 6, 5, and the next number in the pattern should be 4. And then I have 5 plus negative 2, which would give me 3. And I have 5 plus negative 3, which would give me 2. And there's the answer that I've been looking for, the answer to the question 5 plus negative 3. Okay? It's a pattern approach. The idea is to rely on something I already know, the addition of positive numbers, and to be able to sort of bleed that into what do I want to know about adding a negative to something. Yes, trust me. Is there a certain reason why you started with the 5 plus 2? The only reason is because I wanted to establish a pattern, and I need at least three numbers for the pattern to be established. In order, if I'd only had, like, let's say I'd started right here, I don't have a pattern yet. 6, 5 doesn't create a pattern. I mean, like, what am I doing? Am I subtracting 1? Maybe I'll subtract 1, and then I'll subtract 2, and then I'll subtract 3, right? Remember what we were doing back in section uh, 1.2? We need a few things to establish a pattern. So the sort of minimum number would be having three items to establish a pattern, and that was why. Yes, it's a good question. All right. Absolute values. For any integer x, the absolute value of x is equal to x if x is greater than or equal to 0. And the absolute value of x is equal to negative x if x is less than 0. This is the definition for absolute value. And it makes us feel, and it kind of should make us feel a little bit uncomfortable from what you know about what absolute values represent. Absolute values are supposed to represent the distance back to zero. So I want to draw a picture, and this picture will help justify what you think you know and how it still works for this definition. Let's say that we have the absolute value of 5. The reason the absolute value of 5 is 5 is because the distance for 5 back to zero is 5. And if I'd had negative 5, the absolute value of negative 5 would also be 5 because the distance back to 0 is 5. Is the number line image closer, maybe, than my definition to what you think of when you think about absolute values? Right? A lot of times people think absolute values just means take away the negative. Right? If there's a negative, I'm just going to remove it. Well, that's okay. The reason that that's the case is because what you're actually doing is finding a distance, and distances are positive, right? Like, if I wanted to tell you the distance from my house to Shawnee, like to OBU, what, how, I, how I drive, it's about 17 miles. From my house to here is 17 miles, and I do not tell you that from Shawnee back to my house is negative 17, do I? No, we don't talk about distances like that. We talk about it in a positive sense, okay? So what in the world is going on down here when we've got the answer being negative? Well, here's the thing. What we did to get from here is that you thought of it probably as I took away a negative, correct? Maybe. 
If you didn't think about it as a distance, you probably thought of it as I removed a negative or everything became positive, right? Okay, so how do we represent that in mathematical terms? We don't have a symbol that says remove a negative. Like there's not a symbol that says take something away. We only have symbols that say to put something in, right? So what we're actually doing and how this fits is that we're taking that absolute value of negative five and we're putting in a negative. This is the negative that you see present, whoops, not there, this one, is the negative that you see present here. We're inserting a negative, right? What does that negative mean? Well, it means the opposite of. What is the opposite of the x, or the negative five in this case, what is the opposite of the negative five? Well, it's a positive five. So that's how we're getting the positive five over here, is that we're taking the opposite of it. So if the x value is negative, which is how it's designated in the second line of this definition, then the, this negative right here is really more representing the opposite of than it is actually representing a negative number. That's the symbol, that is our symbol of mathematics that we have to represent the opposite of. And equivalently, it will mean that the negative gets taken away because we're talking about a negative number. So let's take a look at a few problems of dealing with absolute values. We're supposed to classify whether these statements are true or false. And if they're false, we show a counterexample. That means an example that shows that it doesn't work. On the first one, <clears throat> um, maybe I should make mention then of these is the fact that we want to make sure that we're getting positive numbers, that we're getting negative numbers. So when we're dealing with trying to decide if absolute values are true, we're usually considering three cases. Values that are positive, does it work? Values that are negative, does it work? And zero, does it work? Does that make sense? So if you're trying to figure out is it true or is it false, those are your three kind of categories because that's how absolute values are affecting things a little bit differently. They affect things a little bit differently if they're positives or negatives. And zero sometimes shows up in a funny way. So we kind of sort of like want to check mark that zero does or doesn't work too, okay? All right, so our goal is to either decide that always it works or that maybe occasionally maybe it doesn't, or maybe a lot of times it doesn't, in which case it's false. So on the first one, absolute value of x to the fourth is equal to x to the fourth. What do you think? True or false? True. Why is that true? Okay. Okay, so there's three things to check. The negatives are the ones that are the potential problem causers here, right? Okay, so if I had x is positive, and you can probably generally, you can just pick any positive number to check all positive numbers because of the way absolute values work. So let's just try something. I don't usually like to test the number one because weird things happen, so let's test the number two. If x is two, what is two to the fourth? 16, okay, 16. So if, if x is two, two to the fourth is 16. All right, that's, that's what this would look like. And over here, two to the fourth is equal to 16. So is the absolute value of 16 equal to 16? Yes, that works, no problem. That one's straightforward work. So positive numbers are gonna be just fine. So let's try it now with a negative, which is what you were suggesting, really. Let's just do negative two. Oh, I didn't mean to put absolute values over here, sorry. Okay, what is negative two to the fourth? It's also 16, for exactly the reason that Rayleigh had mentioned, it's a power of four. So when you multiply two negatives together, you get a positive, right? We'll talk more about how that actually works in section five too, but we get a positive. So this one gives me again, absolute value of 16. This one gives me 16. And is the absolute value of 16 equal to 16? Yes, okay. And then the last thing to test, because sometimes it causes problems, is zero. What is zero to the fourth? Zero. So what is the absolute value of zero? Zero. It's a distance back to itself. There is no distance there, or there's this distance is zero. So this checks out. So this is true. So let's talk about true in general then from the perspective that Rayleigh was talking about. This is true because x to the fourth... <coughs> is always positive. I shouldn't say it that way. Let me write it this way. X to the fourth is greater than or equal to zero. Let's do it that way. 
Thus, x to the fourth is equal to x to the fourth by our definition. Since x to the fourth is always positive, right, that's always the case, since x to the fourth is always positive, this definition said that if it's always positive or, greater, or it's ever greater than or equal to zero, I should say it that way, then, all we, then we are able to just simply remove the absolute values. So that was an even power. What happens when the power changes to odd? It's false. And if you have a tendency to think that it's false, you need to show an example, right? You have to justify a counterexample why it's false. So why is this false? Or get an example of where this is false. Say x is negative 2. All right, so let's let x equal negative 2. So the absolute value of negative 2 to the fifth, and then I have negative 2 to the fifth. All right, so what is negative 2 to the fifth? Okay, so this one's negative 32, and the other one is the absolute value of negative 32. So that's the left-hand side. Negative 32 is the right-hand side. Uh, let me do one more step. What's the absolute value then of negative 32? It's 32. So I'm just, I'm working with two sides of the potential equation to see if it really is an equation that holds true. And at this point, I know it's not, because 32 and negative 32 are not the same thing, right? Those do not equal one another. That means this is a counterexample. So this is a false statement. All it takes is one example of it being false for the thing, thing to be false, okay? This is false, and the reason is because if x is negative, right, which is what we found, then x to the fifth is also negative, right? Negative 2 to the fifth was negative 32, and there's nothing special about it being negative, 32, negative 2. Any negative would do that. So if x is negative, then x to the fifth is negative. So the absolute value of, whoops, good grief x to the fifth would actually equal negative x to the fifth. And this is by definition, right? That's what the definition above said. If it's negative, then the absolute value of it is the opposite of that negative number. So this negative right here is not because I'm creating a negative number. It's because I'm trying to remove the negative that will automatically be present when a negative number is inserted. Okay, a couple more. Absolute value of x is not negative. True or false? That is a true statement. Uh, you can justify it a number of different ways. One way you can justify it is talking about the fact that absolute values are distances. Distances aren't negative. So that's one good justification. I'm going to sort of just verbalize a couple of them and you can pick your favorite to write down. So it's justifiable. Um, secondly, is that you could go back to the definition and you could say, okay, well, the first one starts with a positive number and it ends with that same positive number. The second one starts with a negative number inside of here. And then when I put an additional negative on, it becomes positive, right? So you could justify it by the definition and describe what that's happening or that you could talk about the fact that it's removing the negative, changing its sign of a negative number, okay? So it's a true statement. How about D? Absolute value of X is positive. That is false. All right, tell us what your counterexample is. Um, if x is zero, mm -hmm. Yeah, so remember before I talked about the fact that zero causes some weird things to occasionally happen? Zero is an example. So um, we talked about in class uh, the other day about primes and composites, right? We talked about the fact that there's prime numbers, there's composite numbers, and then there's the number one, and it's neither, right? The same thing's true for the number zero, and I mentioned it that day. There's positive numbers, there's negative numbers, and then there's the number zero, and it's neither. So we have to be careful and pay a little bit more careful attention to zero when these things show up. Sometimes zero makes something work. Sometimes zero makes something fail, if we're looking for those kinds of features. Zero makes this fail, and the reason is because the absolute value is of zero is zero, right? Well, zero is neither positive nor negative, so the absolute value of zero is not positive. It's also not negative, which is why it worked on C, but it's not positive. All right, let's look at the properties of integers. This is going to look and feel just like your properties of whole numbers with one addition. 
I don't think we're going to get to using our chips again. We'll collect them at the end in a minute, though. All right, so the closure property. Closure property for whole numbers and the closure property for integers says the same thing. If A and B are whole numbers, then A, um, then A plus B is a whole number. If A and B are integers, then A plus B is an integer. In other words, I can't add integers together and get a fraction. I can't add integers together and get a square root. I can't add integers together and get anything except for another integer. That's closure. Add two integers, you get an integer. Commutative property of addition says that when I add my integers together in either order, I get the same quantity. A plus B is equal to B plus A. Now that's actually a really nice feature, and let me sort of just do this as an aside to think about the one we just did. We did, at the beginning, we did five plus negative three. Do you guys remember doing that? Okay, somebody might have looked at that and said, well, Dr. Hans, why don't we just do five minus three? And you could, and that would be okay, and it's something you've seen before. Now things get a little bit messier when we get to subtraction with that, but you could do that on this. But if a student starts by looking at this, and this is where my children in my house start getting confused, and it's written in that order, that's when they're just like, I don't know what to do with that. Or they might do it wrong. They're not likely to do 5 plus negative 3 wrong. But they are likely to see negative 3 plus 5 and do it wrong. But if we think about the fact that this is commutative, we could see negative 3 plus 5 that the student keeps doing wrong and say, hey, look, Johnny, if I take negative 3 plus 5 and I turn it around and you see 5 plus negative 3, do you know what to do then? And little Johnny would probably then at least have an idea of what to do because he's got this background knowledge of subtraction that allows him to have a better grounding for what's happening. Right, so the commutative properties are really helpful for um, addition with integers. The next one, the associative property. The associative property, again, looks like uh, A plus, and then we have B plus C. And this is the same as A plus B and then plus C, like that. Right, the order um, of things works um, out for us just like before. Now, again, that's a really nice feature because sometimes there's certain things that are easier to add together, right? Like add all the positives together first, right? And then take away anything that's negative and remove those pieces, that kind of thing. It allows you to regroup, so that's helpful. Identity property of addition. Do you remember what our identity element was for addition? It was zero. So this is the same on this one. So a plus zero is equal to zero plus a is equal to a. And we call zero the identity element, additive identity element. So that's our identity property. This is the new one, though. This is the inverse one. This is the one that I've used multiple times already in our, in our discussion in general and said so I'm going to define it in a minute. Now is the time. For every integer a, there exists a unique integer negative a, or the opposite of a, which is the additive inverse of a, such that a plus negative a equals negative a plus a, which equals 0. And we'll just do a real quick example. We'll do the number 3. If I had 3 plus a negative 3, this is the same thing as negative 3 plus 3, and it's equal to 0. Everything has a corresponding pair. Okay? Uh, and that's true whether the a value is positive or negative. I chose just the order of things to say that my a was 3. But I could have likewise chosen that my a itself was uh, negative 2. Right? We'll do negatives in this time. So what's the additive inverse of negative 2? positive 2, right? And I can flip things around in just the same way where my negative 2 is showing up in the opposite location, where my positive 3 had shown up before and so forth, and it will work. And what would the additive inverse of 0 be? Because this is supposed to work for all integers. Just 0. 0 is his own additive inverse. That's OK. OK, theorem 5, 3, and then we're going to stop for today. We'll pick up a subtraction next time. Theorem 5.3 talks about what happens when we have things like double negatives. Again, I already used that today. I mentioned we'd get there. Now we're there. Okay? So when we have negative negative a, it means that I have a. 
right? And so sometimes you hear people say something like a negative times a negative equals a positive, right? They'll describe it like that. But what's really happening here in terms of like language is that this is saying it's the opposite of negative five, let's say. The opposite of negative five which would be negative of negative five would give me a positive five. It's the opposite of. So if you think about that negative on the outside as representing that language, you get an additional layer of description for why this makes sense. So can we talk about the negative times the negative equals a positive? Well, of course you can. And if that's what resonates for the child, then let them go with it. But if they're struggling to understand why that's working or if they're asking you questions of why that works, the reason it's working is because that negative on the outside is talking about the opposite. It's the opposite of negative five, or the additive inverse of negative five. The second one actually is one we've seen before. We saw this property back with whole numbers. It was the um, additive property of equality, I think is what we called it. It says that if I have two values that are equal and I add something to both of them, they remain equal. And I probably did a description where um, I had somebody, like if I have um, one of... None of my kids now are the same height as me. That won't work. I have two children in my house, two daughters, actually, that are the same height. They're both like 5'7". Okay, so if my two daughters, who are both 5'7", are standing here, they're going to be exactly the same height. Now, if they both go to their rooms and they both put on two-inch heels, they add two inches to their height, and they come back out, they're still going to be the same height, 5'9", right? They're still going to be the same height because you've added the same value to each of their heights. That's what this is describing. And it works for negative numbers just like it worked for positive numbers. And then the last one, C, is talking about what happens when we have a negative plus a negative. So when we have a negative A plus a negative A, and again, this is where my kids start to look at me with these glazed eyes or tell me the wrong values, we add the A and the B together and we keep the sign that's negative. Okay, and we can justify that and we will next time when we come back. Remind me to come back to this one and talk about from a number line perspective what's happening when we do that, or from the chip's perspective, what's happening when we do that, okay? We'll justify why this works next time.